In the future, biometric scans will be able to tell everything about you, and an AI can then identify the likelihood of you committing a crime. The Sybil system of Japan assigns a psycho pass score to indicate such potential for lawbreaking in its citizens. It takes appropriate measures to prevent crimes before they're committed by dispatching special agents to conduct a peaceful arrest. However, most of the time, it ends up in a gruesome loss of life. Akane Tsunamori is a special agent assigned to handling such situations. She runs past a barricade of holographic robots to enter the search area. It's her first day on the job as an inspector, but she's immediately deployed to the field to aid her partner, Inspector Nobuchika Jinoza. The latter briefs her on the suspect, Nobuo Akura, an unemployed man in his 30s, his only crime being a psychopath with a crime coefficient of over 100 and a clouded stress hue of forest green. A street scanner flagged him while he was having his hue checked. A security drone ordered him to undergo therapy, but he refused and is now hiding in an abandoned area where drones cannot enter. To make the situation worse, he's kidnapped a civilian and has taken her within a maze of buildings. Gino and Akani must take him into custody. But they're not the only ones who'll look for the suspect. They will get the help of enforcers, individuals who have high crime coefficients with whom the system labels as latent criminals. Enforcers are under the jurisdiction of inspectors and they are tasked to do the dirty work because more likely than not, they can predict the mentality of latent criminals being one themselves. In this case, four enforcers are under Gino's authority. Shusei Kagari, Yayoi Kunizuka, Tomomi Masaoka, and Kagami Shinya. They all take their own Dominator, a highly powerful technological firearm that can read a person's psychopath on the spot. It can only be operated by an authorized member of the Criminal Investigation Department. It can change its mode based on certain criteria, and its trigger can't be pulled unless the apprehended has a very high crime coefficient. Akani takes her Dominator, and a female voice gives her basic instructions on using it. She has had her training on using the weapon during her university days, but this time it's different. She has to deal with a real person and decide their fate. She finds it curious that the suspect has allowed his hue to become so clouded. She thinks that perhaps if there was another way at that time, he could have cleared his hue and lowered his crime coefficient. The enforcers, mainly Shusi and Masayoka, are curious about meeting Akani. Her nervous disposition is palpable. Gino orders Masayoka and Kagami to accompany Akani, while Shusei and Yayoi will come with him. Masayoka, the middle-aged enforcer, is a gentleman and understands that Akani needs to be shown how things work in the field. Kogami, on the other hand, is more direct. In his cool manner, he tells Akani that she, as the inspector, is responsible for their actions. If she doesn't like what they're doing, she can shoot them. They're tagged as latent criminals, so the dominators will work on them even if they are enforcers. And with that, the two groups start their hunt. Inside one of the buildings, Okura is reflecting on the recent turn of events in his life. Hiding in a dingy room inside one of the buildings, he resents the system. He's been doing his best to restrain himself before getting flagged. Why must he be treated like a criminal when he has never committed any crime? That's what's wrong with the system. Innocent individuals are discriminated against based on numbers and colors. But he doesn't have to worry about that anymore, does he? He can now do what he has always wanted. Looking at his hostage, Okura's mind fills with lascivious thoughts. Holding a penknife to threaten her, he starts to violate the poor woman. Akani is nervous as heck. She points her dominator at innocent bystanders, mistaking them for the suspect. It's such a good feature that the weapon doesn't activate when a person's psycho pass is below 100. But it does recognize Masaoka's crime coefficient of 120, which makes him a good target. Soon they get communications from Shusei. He's found Okura. Pointing his dominator at him, he shoots a non-lethal paralyzer. To his surprise, it doesn't work. Okura must have been on some drugs to negate the dominator's paralyzer. It only infuriates him. He grabs the woman and escapes through the window. Akani and Masaoka receive the update. Akani starts to worry about the hostage. A phenomenon called psychohazard can happen when a suspect's psycho pass becomes so high, it starts affecting anyone nearby. In this case, because of the stress and the threat in her life, the hostage's hue becomes affected and starts getting clouded. In the event of apprehension, the enforcers will have to take her down too. Eventually, Akani and Masayoka find Okura walking unsteadily towards the building's basement, with the woman hoisted on his shoulders. Masayoka calls him out. 
Immediately, Okura brings out his knife and threatens to slash the woman if they don't give him their guns. The enforcer quietly follows Okura's demand with Akani mirroring him. Okura picks up the Dominator, but it won't work for him. Because he's distracted, he doesn't see Kogami whose Dominator is already in lethal eliminator mode. In one shot, Okura becomes a mess of human blood and blobs. Masaoka picks up his gun and aims it at the woman. Her crime coefficient is over 160 and the system is recognizing her as a threat. Akani stops the enforcer from shooting the woman. She reasons the hostage is an innocent bystander. They shouldn't look at her psycho past without considering the situation that greatly affected it. This dispute gives the woman the chance to run away. In the basement, she's found gallons of gasoline and a lighter. If worst comes to worse, she's ready to end it all. She's not thinking clearly, and her fear is controlling her actions. Kagami follows her. He's about to shoot when Akani catches up with him. She orders him to stop. Kagami whispers something and sends Akani a challenging smile. The next thing he knows, he's been shot with a non-lethal paralyzer. Despite shaking so badly, Akani tries to calm the woman by appearing friendly. She asks her to drop the lighter or else the gun may harm her. Just as the woman starts to trust Akani, Gino, who's standing on one of the uh, containers, shoots a paralyzer, effectively making the woman unconscious. Poor Akani looks so lost after realizing that the protocol is that anyone with a high psycho pass must always be apprehended. As the chief investigator, Gino orders her to write a report about her conduct that day. Akani thinks this must be the worst first day on the job story in history. She wakes up the next day tired from lack of sleep. Her household hologram character, Candy, greets her cheerfully and reminds her of her schedule that day. Then we see her doing her morning routine, showing us a glimpse of how advanced technology has become in their world. Aside from having a holographic household companion, Akani can also decorate her house in a specific style, using holograms as well. She can have her food prepared inside a microwave-like device with the consideration of her caloric intake for the day. As for getting dressed, she can choose any style from her wardrobe using a compact disc, and the device can scan her body to put the clothes on her. This is such a marvel in technology that one used to dream about in the past. She meets up with her friends Yuki and Kaori to vent out her worries about her job yesterday. She doesn't reveal the details, but her friends understand that working at the CID is never an easy job. From their conversation, we learn that Akane has always had high grades. She actually qualified for high-ranking jobs, yet she chose to work for the Public Safety Bureau, Crime Investigation Department. She's always had a healthy psycho pass. Even in distress, her hue has always been clear. Another important note from their discussion is that an individual psycho pass greatly influences the field of work they're fit for. That's why those with a very high crime coefficient become stereotyped as lawbreakers, which is quite unfair. Yuki and Kaori comfort their friend as she begins to doubt whether she is fit for her job. As Yuki says, the system chooses people who are capable of doing what needs to be done. Later in the afternoon, Akani reports for her shift. The office of the CID Division 01 is headed by Gino. Together, it's their job to lead criminal investigations, utilizing all the tools available, including their subordinates, the enforcers. They also have another member. Her name is Shion Karanomori, the analyst officer in charge of data analytics. Akani goes to her to find out how Kagami is doing after she shot him. Shion, a blonde bombshell, is also tagged as a latent criminal and despite preferring sarcasm as her humor, is compassionate towards her colleagues. She shows Akani the live feed from Kagami's hospital room, where he is currently resting. As it turns out, Akani has shot him in his spinal cord. It may take a while for him to fully heal. Shion can see that something is bothering the new inspector, so she encourages her to go and see Kagami. But Akani thinks she shouldn't bother him. She proceeds to their office, a space filled with their assigned tables and computers. She's trying to write her report about what happened yesterday, but she can't seem to concentrate. With her are Shusei and Yayoi, their shift about to end. Just as Masaoka enters the office for his shift, they hear from the speakers that an individual has been flagged with a high psycho pass in a nearby department store. Since Gino is not there, Masaoka tells Akane to come with him. They enter the place disguised in hollow suits. To Akani's amazement, Masaoka easily finds the individual and subdues him even without the help of a dominator. He simply takes one look at the man and knows he's the one who's been flagged. When asked about it, Masaoka says he's honed his intuition based on experience. By observing someone, he can tell if the behavior indicates an inclination towards criminal activity. Perhaps that's why his crime coefficient is high because he can identify a criminal behavior when he sees it. 
That night, as Akani takes her dinner, Shusei joins her. He asks her why she joined the Public Safety Bureau. From her build and demeanor, Akani looks like someone not meant for this job. Akani says it's because she's the only one who got an A ranking for the Bureau out of all the applicants. This has made her think that perhaps she could do something significant in this office. She thought she might find her reason for living by working here. But Shusei isn't a fan of her answer. He's been flagged since he was five years old, and therapy wouldn't work on him even if he tried. He has chosen to be an enforcer because he didn't want to be stuck in an isolation facility, it's his only choice. Hearing someone who has more options about their life path spout something nonsense like finding their reason for living is just rubbing him off the wrong way. So he asks her again, why did she become an inspector? Even Akani doesn't know why. So she finally decides to visit Kagami in his ward. Ever since she met him, she has sensed that Kagami is someone who strongly follows his own rules, his own judgment. And that has made her think about her own, whether she has the right judgment to do something. Kagami wakes up to find Akani standing beside him. She bows and apologizes for the mishap she did. She expresses remorse and says that because of her actions, everyone may have thought she was in everyone's way. But Kagami doesn't hold anything against her. In fact, he lauds her for sticking up and doing what she believed was the right thing to do. Being an inspector is not about bringing people down, but about protecting people. Something that he's forgotten in the long time he's been working as an enforcer. If Akani's way of protecting people is by giving them another chance for a better life, then she shouldn't change her morality or think she's in everyone's way. Grateful for this validation, she bows again in gratitude. However, Kogami becomes agitated as he reminds himself why he's remained as an enforcer for so long. He has unfinished business to settle, and he can't stop until he deals with it. The next day, Akani sends her report to Gino. She stands by her belief that what she did was right. Fortunately, they receive good reports about the woman who was the hostage victim the other day. Therapy has helped stabilize her psychopaths, and she is now doing well. This validates her decision to stop the enforcers from using lethal eliminator on her. When Gino asks Kagami about Akani's report, the latter says he has no problem with it. And with that, the case is now closed. We see Kagami doing his physical fitness exercises. In his mind, he believes he should be fit at all times. Not because he's an enforcer, but to be ready for that fateful time when he'll face his greatest enigma. But for now, he and the others will have to deal with a new case. Gino orients Akane while they're on their way to the drone manufacturing facility. The victim's name is Shioyama Daisuke, the third one in this year alone. According to the initial report, the body, which was mutilated by a drone he was testing on, was found at the behavior inspection zone of the facility. At first glance, it looked like an accident, but the fact that it was the third incident that year made the CID extremely suspicious about the goings-on in the facility. Upon arriving, Akani sees the enforcers have also arrived, riding in a separate wagon. She tells Gino she's excited to work with them as colleagues. However, the senior inspector warns her about becoming close with the enforcers. He says that fools learn from experience, while the wise learn from history. She should choose wisely from where she wants to learn. The facility's manager, Kuraudo Goda, welcomes them. He gives them an overview of the place. The drone manufacturing facility is under the Ministry of Economy. It's tasked to create thousands of drones to be used countrywide. The initial phase of manufacturing involves machines, but the last stage, the inspection phase, has always been done by humans. They are called debuggers, and they check for any malfunctions in the drone or bugs in its code. This is a painstaking, round-the-clock labor, and so to avoid distractions, the whole facility is offline. In this way, no hackers can infiltrate the system, and the employees can focus on their work. Goda then leads them to the crime scene, which has been cleaned surreptitiously. The images of the body have been saved in a disk, while the drone that mangled it has been sent to the crime lab. Unfortunately, its codes and systems have been deleted. Goda explains that the employee's psycho passes are always monitored and maintained to an acceptable level, so it's hard to think a suspect is hiding among them. Gino, Yayoi and Kagami talk to Goda in his office to negotiate the investigation. The reports of the employee's deaths strongly suggest that a murderer is among them, despite all the workers having an acceptable psycho pass. Gino suggests all the workers should go outside the facility, and then the enforcers will use the dominators to check each of them. But Goda is adamantly against this, saying he can't sacrifice the facility's operation just because of a hunch about a murderer. He says if the CID has enough evidence, then he'll allow it. Gino and Yayoi go back to their office to organize the employees' data, while Akani and the others stay there. They are having lunch when they witness a group of men bullying someone. His name is Yuji Kanehara, 
and he seems timid to fight back against his bullies. Goda sees it too and explains to them that he's been getting bullied for over a year now. Because the facility is offline, workers find some things for their entertainment, and they think kicking Kanahara is certainly diverting. He adds that the system may have decided to put Kanahara in this facility because he fits the purpose of becoming everyone's entertainment. Kogami has something to say about this. If that's the case, then perhaps the system has found Goda fit to be a manager because he can turn a blind eye to bullying. Now, this shuts Goda up. In their office, Gino, Akani and the enforcers study the hues of the employees. Akani is shocked to find that Kanehara is the most suspicious of all, but the enforcers have already anticipated this. Kanehara's hue is the most clouded before a murder takes place, but it becomes clear afterward. This isn't hard evidence. But adding this to the fact that the victim's deaths suggest their mutilation is done out of severe grudge and that he's been bullied starting around the same time the murders happen. It's understandable that Kanehara becomes their main suspect. However, they need evidence, so they have to come up with a plan to lure him out. Gino suddenly becomes argumentative and assertive towards Masayoka, who presented his hunch, and Kagami, who suggested luring Kanehara out. Akane doesn't understand this, so she talks to Gino in private. Although she doesn't ask his reason, she lets him know she's willing to go with their plans. Gino gives her a long look before saying she's a fool after all. That night, Yayoi and Shusei prepare a 200M communications cable line. Masaoka sets up their stations so the line can connect to the system even if it's inside the offline premises. Kagami and Akani go back inside to talk to Kanahara. To Akani's shock, Kagami hurls hurtful words towards the employee and threatens to make his clouded hue public so he'll be implicated in the murders. Kanahara is terrified. He runs into a room where the drones are kept. He brings out a disc containing a program that allows him to control them. Like a raging mechanical bull, he charges towards Kagami and Akane along with a second drone. The two officers run to the second floor, where Yayoi and Shusei are coming in with their dominators already connected to the system. Kanahara vows to mutilate them all to clear his hue. When Kagami points his gun at him, it shows a crime coefficient of 265, solid proof that he's the one who committed all those crimes. Kagami paralyzes him and destroys the drones using the destroy decomposer mode. They apprehend the unconscious Kanahara. Akane is right again about her intuition on following the enforcer's plan. But as she looks at Kagami, she realizes he has this manic in his eyes while dealing with Kanahara. It's like witnessing a predator cornering its prey. Akane doesn't know what to think of it. Creating an avatar and a virtual world called Colmufield Online is a popular pastime among young people. Of course, Akane is no stranger to this. She has her own avatar named Lemonade Candy. After solving the drone murder case, she logs into one of the famous Comufield Talisman Saloon to ask for wisdom from the host avatar Talisman. Akani relays her concern about one of her colleagues whose morality baffles her. She agrees with what he mostly says, but there are times when she sees him enjoying chasing the criminal. What she saw when Yuji Kanahara was arrested still bothers her until now. The talisman advises her to drop any preconceptions she has in mind about this colleague and try to learn his true character. Masaoka has something different to say when Akani goes to him to ask about Kagami. Masaoka says it's impossible for her to understand Kagami without her crime coefficient going up. What he can say about his fellow enforcer is that he experienced something that greatly affected his psycho pass. Even now, Kagami can't let go of that specific incident, and his determination to deal with it is probably what's keeping his psycho pass high. Their conversation is cut short when Akani receives a short message from Gino. They have a new case to investigate. The scene this time is in a tidy but empty apartment. According to Gino, the home security has reported an oddity in this unit. The toilet has been broken for the past two months. As per regulations, the tenant must file a report about it to have it fixed. The system has flagged it suspicious upon discovering it. The tenant, Kimihiko Hayama, hasn't been in contact for the last two months. Although unemployed, he receives good compensation from an affiliate service provider for having a famous avatar online and hosting a popular commu field. It's like being an influencer in their world. When they check the holographic configuration of the unit, they discover the misplaced sofa, indicating that someone rearranged the furniture but failed to put them back in their original place. Upon investigating, they find a deep scratch mark on the wooden floor. Kagami also finds telltale signs of adhesive tapes on the floor, suggesting that something has been taped there. Kagami's assumption of what happened is too gruesome. He says that Hayama isn't missing, but dead. The suspect, or suspects, must have attacked him two months ago and claimed his life. To avoid leaving evidence, they dismembered the body and flushed the pieces down the toilet. He suggests programming the drones to inspect the unit's drainage system. While they're talking, Shusei gets access to Hayama's profile. 
Akani is shocked to find that the victim's avatar is the famous talisman, whom she talked to just a few hours ago. If Hayama's dead, then who is taking over his avatar? At their headquarters, Shion confirms the presence of body remains inside the drainage. It's not yet conclusive that it's Hayama, but the CID is almost certain of it. About the suspect taking over the avatar, Shion reports that whoever it is is using a suspicious but secure server with several fake IP addresses. It's not advisable to track the person carelessly, but they can assume the suspect hasn't found out about them, so that's their advantage. For now, their lead is the avatar talisman. They decide that Akani and Gino should visit its commu field. Once there, Akani explains that Talisman is very famous among internet users. His commu field, the Talisman Saloon, is a safe online space for those seeking advice for their problems. A few seconds later, they see him entering another commu field. Akani recognizes this is the space of Spooky Boogie, a well-known anarchist and currently the number one avatar. As Akani and Gino talk, someone pulls Akani away into a private virtual chat room. Spooky Boogie has recognized Akani. The person behind Spooky Boogie says she knows her because they've attended the same high school. She also knows that Akani is with the CID, and her presence there means she's in the middle of an investigation. Akani doesn't reveal the details but asks if there's anything odd about the person behind Talisman. Spooky Boogie says nothing seems amiss about him these days. But two months before, the Avatar showed erratic behaviors. She says the Avatar had been hosting several events intended to get affiliate money. This contributed to his popularity's gradual decline, but then he suddenly changed and is now beloved by his followers again. Spooky Boogie finds this odd because it's hard for a declining avatar to make a comeback. By the end of their discussion, she offers to aid the CID in her investigation. She'll host a physical party at Club Exocet under the guise of challenging Talisman into a virtual battle. There, the CID can take whoever's controlling Talisman into custody. Gino and the others agree with this plan. Akani is sent to mingle with the party-goers while wearing their avatars as holosuit. Masaoka and Kagami will provide support, while Gino, Yayoi and Shusei stand guard at the doors. What they don't know is that the owner of the club, Cho Gusong, is in cahoots with the person controlling Talisman. He's found out that someone among the guests is carrying a dominator, so he makes things hard for Akani and the others. Just as she approaches the suspect, Gusong simultaneously hacks all the holosuits to look like Talisman. Chaos ensues when Masayoka and Kagami charge in with their dominators. Outside, Gino and others can't move because of the confusion. In her commu field, everyone is blaming Spooky Boogie for the fiasco. Since they're engaging in discussions against the system, they're afraid the CID may be after them. Spooky Boogie strongly denies her involvement, but Talisman joins the crowd and insinuates she helped the officers get inside the club. Then he accuses her of betraying her character that she doesn't deserve to be an avatar loved by everyone. He implies he can take over because he knows more about her than she does herself. In real life, Shoko Sugawara, the owner of the Spooky Boogie avatar, is incensed by Talisman's audacity. She starts banning him in her commu field. But before she's done, someone says it's not necessary. A man behind her strangles her, chuffing the life out of her body. This man is Masatake Mido, the one who's taken over Talisman and will now be taking over Spooky Boogie. Just outside the room, his accomplices, Gusong, and a third one named Shogo Makishima are waiting. Shogo seems to be pleased about Mido's enthusiasm for what he's about to do to Shoko's lifeless body. The next day, through her avatar, Akani reaches out to Spooky Boogie to discuss what happened last night. But Spooky Boogie only expresses her disappointment about the police and says she'll never work with them again. Akani relays this conversation with her colleagues. Shion is monitoring Talisman's online activity, whose popularity seems to have grown since last night. Gino and the others are still figuring out the motive behind taking over Hayama's avatar. Gino wants to track the IP addresses used by the suspect, but Kagami has another thing on his mind. The two challenge each other before deciding to do their own thing. Kagami studies the conversations Akani had with Spooky Boogie. Upon comparing the conversation before the raid to the one earlier, he finds a significant difference. Spooky Boogie has never used the word police before, but earlier she used it. It can be an indication that the suspect may have taken over the Spooky Boogie avatar as well. Meanwhile, Gino and the others have found the location of one of the proxy IP addresses. The apartment unit, however, has been set up with bombs. Thankfully, none of them gets hurt. Kagami calls Gino to update him about their findings. His hunch has been proven. The suspect has claimed the life of Shoko Sugawara and has taken over Spooky Boogie and its commu field. They have identified her using the information that she used to be Akani's schoolmate. 
The murder method is the same as that of Hayama's. After hearing the report, Gino orders everyone to reconvene at their office to rework their strategy. In their office, Shion discovers another case that can be related to the current one. Half a year ago, a student named Yuichi Takito passed away in an accident. He used to use his grandfather's avatar, Melancholia, and operated its commu field, Rainy Blue. However, unbeknownst to the grandfather, Melancholia continues to communicate online to this day. He thinks the money he receives is his pension instead of the affiliate money the avatar earns. Shion adds that if the person operating this avatar is the same suspect thereafter, then he must be a heavy user who can perfectly imitate the originals to avoid suspicion. Gino questions why the fans of these three avatars never noticed any differences. Why can't they identify that a fake has taken over them? Kagami answers this question. It's not a matter of being fake or real. Avatars are considered icons on the internet. As long as there are people who idolize the ideologies these avatars present, the avatars will remain. The true feelings of the people behind them are insignificant in this regard. With this premise, it's possible that a fan can do the same, or even a better job at propagating these ideologies, so other fans can keep supporting the avatars. Kagami is suggesting that a fan may be the common thread between Melancholia, Talisman and Spooky Boogie, someone who knows them very well and can imitate them perfectly. He asks Shion to first draw up the data of the top 100 fans of Talisman and find which one stopped entering the Avatar's commu field two months ago. This pattern of online activity should be present with the top 100 fans of Melancholia and Spooky Boogie. This indicates that the suspect stopped using his own avatar once he'd taken over others. Shion gets a hit. A man named Masatake Mido is the only one who fits the criteria. After a few more clicks, Shion gets Mido's whereabouts. His last online trace is detected at a hotel at Roppongi, while his home address is at the nearby Motoazabu. Gino orders Akane, Kagami and Masaoka to go to the hotel while he and the others check the home address. On their way, Akane wonders why Masaoka is bringing a bottle of alcohol with him. But she finds out soon enough. Mido has set a holographic trap inside the hotel room. He even hacks the nearby hollow suits so that the innocent maids will look like him. Kagami throws a lighter to Masaoka, and the latter blows out fire from his mouth using the liquor. This triggers the sprinkler system, which renders the holograms useless. Kagami manages to shoot him in the arms before he runs away. Mido enters his home and immediately activates his three avatars. Melancholia, Talisman and Spooky Boogie all look at him endearingly. Mido has always idolized these avatars and internalized the ideas they presented. For him, they are more real than their original owners. However, someone takes over these avatars. Shogo Makishima expresses his disappointment at Mido. The reason Shogo helped him in the first place is because Mido can perfectly imitate avatars. And that made him interested in what his personality was like. But Shogo realizes that Mido is an empty husk of a human who relies on others to tell him what to believe, just another avatar to be controlled. Mido becomes erratic and demands Shogo to get out of his avatars. He's so distracted that he doesn't notice Gino, Yayoi, and Shusei entering his room. When he does, he finally meets his demise. The case is closed, but Akani is still ruminating about something. Kagami is tagged as a latent criminal and has a high crime coefficient. But he has comforted her about Shoko's death and encouraged her to do her best. She finds it hard to believe he has the same mind as a homicidal maniac like Mido. Gino advises her to firmly draw a line between her as an inspector and the enforcers to keep her psycho pass safe. He had a partner before who made this mistake. To Akani's surprise, Gino is referring to Kagami. It turns out, Kagami used to be an inspector. However, an unsolved case caused his crime coefficient to go high, resulting in his demotion as an enforcer. Now, Akani wonders what case it was that completely changed Kagami. She thinks that if she looks at the database, Kagami may find out she's snooping in on him. So she decides to ask her colleagues. Between Shusei and Shon, Akani gets a general idea of what happened three years ago. When Kagami was still an inspector, he and Gino handled a case they named the Specimen Case. At the heart of this was something called plastination. It was a process of using a specialized resin to create biological specimens. In simple words, human tissues are turned to plastic for preservation. Plastination was used to make the victims suffer a grotesque death. First, they were dismembered. Then, the bodies were inserted with the resin to turn them into plastic. After this, the corpses were displayed publicly, although under the guise of holographic illumination. At first, people thought the displays were simply like that displays. 
But when they found out the truth, their psycho pass rose to alarming levels, and the area stress became so high that a news ban about the case was implemented. One enforcer under Kagami's jurisdiction was Mitsuru Sasayama. He unfortunately lost his life during the investigation. Before Kagami could find out who the culprit was, the chief of the Public Safety Bureau closed the case. This was because of another unrelated case being investigated at the same time. Kuzaburo Toma, a high school teacher, went missing. When investigators looked into his apartment, they found plastic resins similar to the ones used in the specimen case, which ultimately tied him to the murders. He had never been found, but the PSB chief made it look like he was the culprit, and his being missing was like solving the case. This was despite the fact that they didn't know who manufactured the resin, nor who gave it to the murderers. Kagami has never been the same since. He kept investigating despite the case being closed. This caused his crime coefficient to go high and his demotion to enforcer, but he has never given up. He strongly believes he will have the chance again to find the main culprit behind it. One can say he may have developed an obsession with it. Gino is currently questioning Yuji Kanahara, the culprit in the drone murders. He wants to find out how Kanahara acquired the disc that contains the specific code to control drones and turn them rogue. Upon discussing this with his team, they shine light on seemingly trivial things. For the drone case, anyone can figure out that someone is bound to have a clouded psychopath just by looking at the periodic checkups. Someone may have found a way to send Kanahara the disc, which will help him let out his suppressed inclination to kill. On the other hand, in the Avatar murder case, Mido was certainly obsessed with social networks, but he didn't have the skill to mess with holograms. This indicates he may have had help from someone. Shion adds her conclusion that after analyzing the data from both cases, the one who programmed the disc may be the same person who hacked the holosuits. It's only logical to think that a highly skilled cyber criminal is involved, but the question is why. Kagami corrects them, saying both Kanehara and Mido have the motives to kill. They only need the means to do it, which apparently was conveniently given to them by someone. To everyone's surprise, he suddenly walks out of the office. Gino follows him, knowing what's on Kagami's mind. The latter goes to his unit and brings out a folder that still contains the details from the specimen case. He insists that the main culprit in this case is involved with Kanahara and Mido. Back then, plastic resins were the means to commit a crime, and now it's a software program. In both cases, someone is enabling these would-be killers to manifest their desires. Kagami strongly believes the same person is involved. He vows to catch the culprit, if that's the only way to settle the score for the sake of Sasayama. Their new case is about to begin, and this time the location will be at Usu Academy. It's a conservative, all-girls school, where the administration promises to keep their students' psychopaths at an acceptable level. But they can't control everything, and they can't know anything. Their popular student, Rikako Uryu, is already in league with Shogo Makishima, the same one who encouraged Mido with his murderous tendencies. From how things look, Rikako may have already committed a heinous crime under his tutelage. Two personnel from the Public Cleaning Bureau are trying to fix a glitching fountain hologram. When it is turned off, they find a very unusual object at the bottom. They're not sure if it's an artwork or something else. The best way they can describe it is like a doll poised elaborately but in poor taste. If it's an artwork, it's definitely something they won't display in their homes. The Public Safety Bureau Criminal Investigation Division has received reports about the unusual object discovered at the base of the fountain in the park. Inspectors Nobuchika Hinoza and Akane Tsunomori, along with enforcer Shinya Kagami, are there to assess the situation. At first glance, they all have a hunch that this case will be eerily similar, if not the same, to the specimen case that happened three years ago. As a precaution, Gino removes Kagami from the case and assigns Akane to look after him. He doesn't want the enforcer's preconceived notions to affect their investigation. For context, the specimen case is a series of murders that occurred throughout the city. Plastination, the process of turning organic tissues into plastic specimens, was applied to dismembered human corpses, which were spread along the streets hidden beneath holographic structures. The case was never solved. It affected Kagami so much that his psycho pass went so high that the Sybil system tagged him as a latent criminal and was demoted to being an enforcer. But it never deterred Kagami from pursuing the truth. Even in the present, he's kept the records relating to the case, believing that one day he'll catch the real culprit. In the office, Gino discusses the information they have at hand. The victim's name is Kazuhara Satsuki, a student at Uso Academy. The chemicals found on the corpse are the same as the one used three years ago. Enforcer Masaoka points out that this school is the same one where the main suspect of the specimen case, Tumakuzaburo, came from. 
He used to teach there, but he went missing at the height of the case's investigation. He got tied to the case because plastic resins were found in his home. He has never been found though, and with the recent discovery of the corpse, it's probable for them to think the same suspect is involved again. Another enforcer, Shusei, laments that Kagami should be in this case. Kagami is spending his free time sparring with the droid available in their department, with Akani dutifully watching him. When he finishes, she looks at his stats and is surprised to see that he set the sparring difficulty to the highest level. When asked about this, Kagami explains this is his way to feel worthy of using a powerful arsenal such as the Dominator. It's his philosophy that at the end of the day it's not the gun that ends a criminal's life. It's him that pulls the trigger. Combat training helps him develop that sense of accountability and mental strength that's needed to wield such a powerful weapon. Later, Akani asks him some relevant questions about the specimen case. She asks if he's angry about her snooping in on him. Kagami clears that he's not angry with her, nor does he regret allowing it to change his psycho pass. He's only angry because he never discovered the real culprit. At that time, Tuma took the blame, but Kagami never believed he was the mastermind. Next, she asks about Mitsuru Sasayama, the enforcer who passed away during the investigation. To her surprise, Kagami describes his late colleague as a real piece of work. Regardless, he found him an interesting guy. He reveals that Sasayama suffered a horrible death by getting dismembered while still alive before getting inserted with a resin. What is infuriating to this day is the fact his corpse was found under a holographic advertisement for a pharmacy. It said, Our safe stress care will transport you to a world without suffering. A heartless message by the mastermind. Kogami is intent to find the real culprit and make him suffer the same way as Sasayama. Akane asks if he has a lead, and Kogami says yes. He shows her a blurry picture he found in Sasayama's file, and its file name is Makishima. At Usu Academy, the discovery of the corpse of one of their schoolmates causes a stir among the students. Kagami expresses her worries to Mika, especially about her friend Yoshika, who hasn't attended school for days now. Mika looks indifferent about the situation, but she advises Kagami to talk to Rikako Uryu, since Yoshika seems to be infatuated with her. Unfortunately, Mika will soon regret this advice. You see, Rikako is the main perpetrator. She has already gotten Yoshika on her bed, naked and lifeless. She talks to the girl as if she's still alive, telling her about her father. Ruichi Uryu was a celebrated artist, but at the height of his career a decision altered his life, which led him to live in a vegetative state. Just that morning he passed away. Rikako has felt cold about his passing. In fact, she's felt cold ever since her father became a useless invalid. She sees the death of her father as caused by a pathogen that will never be wiped out because humans have always wished for it. The slow death that is called serenity. But now she has the means and support she can revive her father's forgotten art. She's already started with what she did to her first victim, and she expects that authorities will soon find her second art installation. With Yoshika as the third, she feels unstoppable. Nah. After getting dressed, she packs the corpse into a suitcase, then drops it into a chute. It leads directly to an abandoned generator room way below the school grounds. It's night time, and most of the students and workers are asleep. So no one sees her entering a secret entrance to the generator room. There, Cho Gosung is waiting for her. He's there to deliver the resin that Rikako intends to use to make her art. He's also attending the school, pretending to be a student to keep an eye on her. He's following the orders of Shogo Makishima, Rikako's enabler in her crimes. Shogo is in his mansion, discussing his current protege with an old man named Toyohisa Senguji. Shogo tells Toyohisa he took an interest in Rikako because of what happened to her father. As mentioned earlier, Ruichi used to be a prominent artist. Despite being firm with his moral beliefs, his art showed grotesque depictions of girls' dismembered bodies to express his ideology. That humans have an innate cruelty residing deep within their hearts. By being aware of it, it helps foster common sense, the ability to reason and goodwill to control that cruelty. However, Shogo adds, when the psychopath's assessments became widespread, Ruishi willingly gave in to the system. We learn that there is a placed stress care procedure that helps people manage their stress levels. Because of this, people gave up controlling themselves, becoming dependent on machines that could take care of their mental health. Ruishi saw the technology as the end to his lifelong goal of enlightening people. However, he became too addicted to stress care, leading to his vegetative state and his eventual death. He calls Ruichi's condition eustress deficiency cerebral infarction and says many people have actually perished from it. Although it has no official name since the government refuses to recognize this silent epidemic, choosing to describe the deaths as heart failure from unknown cause. Shogo believes Rikako has the motive to commit crimes, 
because she wants to take revenge on the system that killed her father twice, first his art and then his life. He wants to see if the daughter can live up to the father's reputation and if she can shake the system. The next day, as Rikako expects, the police find the second victim at a different location in the same park. The victim's name was Masami Yamaguchi, another student of Usu Academy. With the addition that two more girls are missing from the dormitories, the school employs strict security measures. The CID is also there to lead the investigation, albeit under the guise of hollow suits to protect the stress levels of students. No one suspects that the popular and serene Rikako and the charming art teacher Shogo, posing as Mr. Shibata, are the ones behind these gruesome deaths. Shogo asks Rikako why she chose students from the school to be her art pieces. The young student gives a disturbing explanation about the core of her art as she paints an uncanny illustration of her two latest victims, Yoshika and Kagami. Rikako says that Usu Academy is a traditional educational institution established upon two virtues, chastity and grace. These two virtues, expected from girls but not from boys, are instilled among them up until they graduate. From Rikako's point of view, the school sees the girls as rough stones, carved to perfection to produce an art called Lady, to be displayed in front of and purchased by men who are looking for ornaments called a good wife and mother, through a formality called marriage. All students are components of that art. Therefore, as an artist, Rikako sees it as her duty, her right, to use the same components to express her ideology that girls can bloom in different ways. This is also her way of honouring her father by bringing his masterpieces out of canvas into life. Shogo considers her answer and is quite impressed by it, but he realises that Rikako has already reached her potential and therefore is becoming uninteresting. As Gino and the rest discuss their investigation, Akani and Kogami are also doing their part. Kogami says his intuition tells him that the culprit for this case is different from that of the specimen case. For one thing, the corpses from the specimen case were arranged in such a bizarre manner and were placed in strategic places to send a strong and specific message. But for this one, all the victims are found in the park, a place where anyone can see them. It's as if the place is chosen to get the public's attention, more than sending a strong message. If this is true, then it's probable that the perpetrator doesn't have any originality. The way the bodies are arranged may only be to stir awareness or revive a certain style. With these insights, Kagami starts listing the possible characteristics of the culprit. Highly intelligent, belonging to an affluent family, young and hasn't experienced abuse based on the way the bodies were handled. Akane looks at him, amazed at how he confidently assumes the perpetrator. Kagami tells her it's called profiling, a method that was used before the civil system took over. Then, he asks permission if they can go somewhere else, to which Akani agrees. The two proceed to a rehabilitation center where people with crime coefficients higher than 300 are detained. They talk to someone named Koichi Ashikaga, a former art dealer. Kagami believes that their culprit may be an artist. He shows Koichi the pictures of the bodies retrieved from the park. Koichi instantly recognizes the similarities between the pictures and the paintings of Ruichi Uryu. As proof, he shows them the famous gruesome painting of the artist. The name doesn't ring a bell. But when Akani checks the record of Usu Academy, she finds that one of the students is a direct relative. Without wasting time, the two go there. Kogami finds the daughter, Rikako, alone and calmly painting inside the art room. He points his dominator at her, showing a whopping reading of 472 crime coefficient. The teacher stops him from shooting, giving Rikako a chance to escape. Her popularity helps her hide from the enforcer, and with the help of Gosung still dressed as a student, she manages to get away into the school underground. Kogami asks Yayoi to check the surveillance cameras and isolate all footage with Rikako in it. While waiting for results, he explains to Gino that if the suspect is Tuma Kuzaburo from the specimen case, he would never display his victims in the park twice. And even if Rikako isn't the true culprit, they can't let her get away with such a high crime coefficient. After a few minutes, they find footage of her entering the secret entrance. When the CID goes there to apprehend her, the place is empty. Instead, they find her third artwork. Mika is devastated as she looks at the authorities retrieving the bodies of her friends. Unbeknownst to them, Shogo, still posing as a teacher, is listening to the recorded security footage from one of the cameras he installed around the school. He hears Kagami making his deductions, and instantly, he takes an interest in him. But for now, he needs to clean his traces before the CID can uncover his relation to Rikako. Kogami is still studying the tapes when he realizes some of them have been altered, especially the ones found inside the art room. He tries to restore it, but he can only retrieve a portion of the audio. 
However, it becomes a significant piece of evidence as Rikako addresses someone as Mr. Makishima. But where is Rikako? She has been led deep into the underground chambers by Gosung. At one point, Rikako realizes she's alone. Shogo calls her and tells her she has disappointed him immensely. She has no idea what he's talking about. Before cutting her off, Shogo leaves her a quote from Titus Andronicus, Rikako's favorite literature about cruelty. When the call ends, Rikako realizes her end is about to come. Indeed, Toyohisa is already hunting her with his two robotic dogs. In a few minutes, we see one of the dogs cutting Rikako's hand and Toyohisa blowing her head off with a shotgun. At the school, the search for Rikako is still ongoing, but Kagami knows she'll never be found again. To his surprise, Gino approaches him and apologizes for taking him off the case. Gino has realized that Kagami has given more thought about the specimen case than anyone else, and now that a similar case has appeared, his inputs are as valuable as any records on file. Days after their investigation at the academy, Kogami decides to bring Akani to a well-known criminal behavior researcher. Along the way, they watch the video of an interview with Toyohisa Senguji, the same man who hunted Rukako down. As it turns out, he's interested in immortality and a pioneer of cyberization. In fact, except for his brain and nervous system, his whole body is cybernetic. He is also the president of a company that works on underground redevelopment. The interview focuses on his proposition about turning humans into cyborgs. He argues that, in the present times, humans are already embodying the definition of a cyborg. Their heavy reliance on electronic devices mimics the feedback process that's the core of cyberization. And yet, people are still apprehensive about the idea. For Toyohisa, the whole history of science is a history of expanding the human body's functionality, thus the history of human cyberization. Kagami doesn't care much about the topic of cyborgs or immortality. A few minutes later, they arrive at the house of Professor Joji Saiga. He specialized in clinical psychology but chose to focus more on criminal research. He used to lecture in universities about criminal profiles before the civil system took over the country. Now he's retired and enjoying a more traditional lifestyle in the woods without any AI help or holograms. Kagami asks him two things. First, to teach Akani the basics of criminal profiling and second, to allow him access to the people who used to attend his lectures. His first purpose is easy to understand, since criminal profiling is a good alternative to the Zibble system. As for the second one, it has something to do with Makishima and the recent cases. He strongly suspects that Makishima is someone with the charisma of a leader or a hero. He also thinks Makishima may have attended one of Prof. Saiga's lectures about profiling. With this knowledge paired with charisma, Kagami can understand how Makishima manages to enable the motives of those individuals he influences. It may be a long shot, but it's worth a try and a step closer to finding him. Later, on their way home, Akane asks why were the professor's lectures not in the database? Kagami says that those who attended were found to have a clouded psycho pass afterward. With this discovery, the government decided to stop the lectures and let the system take over. Back in their office, Masayoka gives a presentation about their recent case. He shows a picture of Shibata Yukimori, an elderly man who resides in a nursing home. Yet Usu Academy shows records of recently employing him as an art teacher. This implies that Makishima, who posed as Mr. Shibata, is very good at concealing his real identity and falsifying records. In addition, Yayoi discovers that all video records of Makishima have been destroyed. The only real evidence they have is the short audio recovered by Kagami. They have tried resorting to the traditional composite sketch, but no significant results were generated. The next day, Kagami and Akani report to the office. Gino has learned about their trip to the professor and immediately confronts them about it. He reprimands Kagami for bringing Akani to the professor, thereby endangering her psychopaths. To Akani, he calls her a childish brat for her so-called reckless behavior, who thinks she knows everything but knows nothing. Akani takes offense at this. She tells Gino she respects his seniority in their work, but they're still on equal footing when it comes to their ranks. She demands him to show respect for her abilities as an inspector, especially in front of their colleagues. Everyone is taken aback upon hearing this, and Gino simply steps away. Still fuming, Akani marches her way to the HR department to file a report about Gino. Thankfully, she doesn't proceed with her plans after hearing Masayoka explain Gino's side. As it turns out, his father was tagged a latent criminal. This was back when the civil system was new and there was no adequate information about psychopaths, hues and crime coefficients. Being tagged was a big deal because it stigmatized people from their loved ones. Gino was still young at that time and never understood the rumors swirling about his father. Then the same thing happened with Kagami. 
when his psychopath got cloudy because of the specimen case. Masaoka explains that for Gino, it felt like being betrayed twice. Now, it makes sense why Gino told Akani to draw a line between her and her colleagues, because he doesn't want her to experience the same grief with her loved ones, just as he did with his own. As the CID deals with their office drama, Shogo is already making his next moves. He asks Toyohisa to hunt a certain someone from the CID. Toyohisa loves hunting, especially when the prey is smart and tough. He believes the chase keeps him young. He prepares the barrels for his gun as he and Shogo discuss Shinya Kogami, Shogo's newest conquest. In the middle of the night, Akani is woken by an unexpected message from Yuki, one of her close friends. Yuki wants to meet her at the abandoned section of the city to discuss something important. The next day, Akani finds out Yuki has been missing all night. She asks Kogami to accompany her to the location indicated in the message. Upon arriving there, Kogami instantly knows that a trap is waiting for them. He thinks someone wants to get to Akani by setting up this elaborate meetup. So he instructs the inspector to stay outside while he enters the premises. In case they need a backup, Akani can easily call for them. He also asks permission to carry a weapon. All set, Kagami walks down the stairs, with Akani guiding him using the digital map of the area. At first, nothing unusual happens, but at one point, the communication between the two becomes glitchy, then restores itself after a moment. Kagami doesn't notice that Akani's voice has become somewhat robotic. He follows her instructions to board the rusty train in front of him. Without warning, the vehicle suddenly roars to life and speeds away. He has no choice but to check the main car where the controls are. There, he finds a woman in her nightdress. As for Akani, she panics when the communication gets cut after the glitch. She can still see Kagami's position, but she becomes perplexed when the enforcer suddenly moves in a fast and straight line. She decides to call for backup. Inside the train car, Kagami finds out that the lady is Yuki, Akani's missing friend. He checks the voice recorder for Akani's instructions earlier. That's when he realizes that someone has created a well-made voice sample of the inspector to make it sound like she's still communicating with him. But in truth, it's a ruse to separate the two of them. In addition, he's wrong in his first assumption that someone was luring Akani into a trap by using Yuki. It's apparent that the mastermind knows it won't be Akani who will go and look for her friend, but him. Does this mean the real target is him? The train stops eventually. Kogami tries to contact Akani, but something is jamming their communication signals. Suddenly, they hear the menacing prowling of a robotic dog, prompting them to enter the open door. They find themselves inside a largely abandoned facility way below the ground. They gather their bearings despite the dim surroundings. Way above them are Shogo and Toyohisa, already anticipating their arrival. It's Shogo who orchestrated everything from kidnapping Yuki to directing them inside the place. Toyohisa's role is to hunt the two, which he is more than willing to do. They see a bag on their way filled with glow sticks. Kagami uses these instead of his flashlight to light their way, to avoid giving away their location to their hunter. Soon, they discover that the place is filled with traps. They continue to walk until Yuki finds another bag. She picks it up without thinking. It's too late for them to realize that the bag is equipped with a device that calls the robotic dog to their location. The two run away, only to find that an old man is already waiting for them, his shotgun ready in his hands. Toyohisa fires but misses his targets. Kogami and Yuki hide behind a wall. Kogami understands they are the prey in this hunt. They need to be careful on their next move, or they may lose their lives in an instant. He asks Yuki to hand him the bag she picked up earlier. Inside, he finds a portable transponder, but without its antenna or its battery. It's clear that he needs to find the missing components, but first, he must get rid of that robotic dog, or that man that's hunting them. He orders Yuki to stay hidden there. Kagami gets out of hiding, exposing himself to Toyohisa and his dog. When he turns around a corner, he's surprised to find a second dog running towards him. He meets the robotic animal and destroys its circuits using the weapon Akani gave him earlier. The robotic dog falls under a trap, meeting its demise. But Kagami finds the battery taped there. He grabs it and returns to Yuki, dodging Toyohisa's bullets along the way. Then the two run again to find a new hiding spot. A few minutes of running gives Kagami enough time to contemplate their situation. It's clear now that he's the original target, and the mastermind only used his relation to Akane and Akane's relation to Yuki to lure and trap him here. But the discovery of the transponder and the mini quest to find its components don't seem to add up, unless the mastermind is trying to test him, for what reasons he can't fathom. 
but he's sure that his next decision, including whether to leave Yuki or not, will be taken into consideration. And speaking of Yuki, if her only role is to serve as bait, then she should have been let go when Kagami arrived. He suddenly gets an idea. He asks Yuki to hand him her brassiere. As expected, he finds the missing antenna, which is cleverly hidden inside the small pocket usually filled with the underwire. He assembles the transponder, and it starts to send and receive signals. Meanwhile, Gino is being severe to Akani, underlining her incompetence in allowing Kagami to run away. Perhaps he's crossed some invisible line, because Masaoka suddenly grabs his collar like a toddler and admonishes him for going too far. Everyone is surprised, most especially Akani, as an unexpected realization hits her. But there's no time to ponder about this. Kagami's signal has finally reached them. Everyone becomes alert as they get ready for their next move. Gino instructs Masaoka and Akani to look for Kagami, while he, Yayoi, and Shusei look for the signal jammer. With that, they separate ways. Kogami, trusting that his colleagues have gotten his message, focuses on eliminating the remaining robotic dog and its master. At first, he finds it very risky to jump out of his hiding place. Fortunately, the minicart containing his dominator finally arrives. Just as Shusei finds the signal jammer and destroys it, Kogami activates his weapon and fires it towards the robotic dog, reducing it to pieces. The hunter is the only remaining enemy, or so Kagami thinks. Shogo has been watching the events from the upper floor. He contacts Toyohisa and asks him to leave, as it's only a matter of time before the CID apprehends him. But the old cyborg refuses to turn tail. Throughout his long life, he's fine-tuned his hunting abilities. Each time he hunts, he always catches the prey. This time, he recognizes that things are totally different, and it makes his blood more alive with adrenaline. He decides he will not leave and he will face his target, not as a hunter, but as a duelist. Shogo acknowledges Toyohisa's decision and praises him for his bravery, but his eyes are showing his real thoughts, that he couldn't care less about Toyohisa. He's only a pawn in his game. For the next few minutes, we see an intense chase between Kogami and Toyohisa. Both are holding their weapons with the intention to kill. At one point, Kogami manages to shoot Toyohisa's arm. However, the latter fires back, hitting the enforcer on the side of his stomach. Toyohisa is relentless, knowing he's at an advantage because of his cyborg body. He finds a trail of blood and follows it. When he turns around, he points his gun, only to find Yuki staring defiantly back at him. To his right, Kagami is already aiming his dominator at him. The weapon reads, Toyohisa's crime coefficient as 328, an eligible target for elimination. Kagami fires, hitting its target. Toyohisa is no more, leaving only his metal body parts. Yuki goes to Kagami, but the latter can't stand due to the critical hit he received. Before he loses consciousness, he sees another man handcuffing Yuki and grabbing her. This man is younger, tall, and with white hair. The man says he would have stayed with Kagami, but he doesn't seem well. And with that, he drags Yuki away. When Kagami wakes up, Akani is already beside him, with Masaoka preparing first aid. He tells her that another person has taken her friend away. Without thinking, Akani follows the direction that he pointed at. Soon, Gino and the others arrive at where Kagami and Masaoka are. Yayoi checks the surroundings, where they find the remains of the culprit. They are surprised that Senguji Toyohisa, a well-known member of the Ministry of Welfare, is the one behind this incident. Masaoka grabs their attention, saying they should be looking for Akani because she's in grave danger. Indeed she is, but not in a physical manner. She finds Yuki being dragged by a white-haired man. He introduces himself as Shogo Makishima, Akani is stunned to finally meet this elusive man. But the more surprising part is that the Dominator reads his crime coefficient as below 100, a number that's not eligible for elimination, although she can clearly see him show signs of criminal behavior. She orders him again to let go of Yuki and that he's under arrest for committing multiple crimes. But Shogo questions her statement. What crimes did he commit? Are those crimes decided by the civil system? If so, then how come her Dominator won't read his psychopath properly? He goes on to say that his hue has always been white and unreadable to the somatic scans. He always finds it questionable that the system has criteria for separating good people from the bad, yet it doesn't take into consideration the people's will. He has figured it's the only thing that puts value into a person. Because once a person gives in to the system, then his will, his choice, have all become non-existent, making him worthless and an empty husk of a human. He adds that the only ones who can judge him for his crimes are those who have the will to commit them. He throws the shotgun to Akani. She's still pointing her dominator at him, but the weapon fails to register his psychopaths as criminally aligned. Shogo tells her to shoot him, or else he'll take Yuki's life. 
With no choice, Akani picks up the gun, but her knees are shaking so badly she can't hold both weapons properly. Shogo continues to taunt her, saying she'll only rescue her friend if she manages to pull the trigger. He urges her to let her will, her killing intent, take over. It's a sensation she'll never experience with the Sybil system, which always decides for them. As if to prove what he's saying, the Dominator reads a low crime coefficient for Shogo and locks the trigger. For the first time, Akani realizes the system is failing to do what must be done, the right action to take. And because she has no intent to kill, only the intent to save, she haphazardly pulls the trigger on the shotgun firing its last two bullets. Shogo is disappointed. To him, Akani is just another puppet of the system, a person with no will. He ends things by sliding the straight-edge blade he's holding across Yuki's neck. Akani's scream fills the air. In the next scene, we see multiple police cars surrounding the building. Kagami has already been attended to by the paramedics. On one side, he sees Masayoka looking after the shaken Akani. He goes to her. She tells him she has met Makishima, while blaming herself for her friend's demise. Her voice is filled with regret and immense disappointment, as she says the Dominator can't judge Shogo Makishima. To alleviate our depressive feelings from the recent events, Let's take a look at the history of one of the enforcers under Inspector Gino's authority. Three years ago, Yayoi Kunizuka used to be a musician before getting recruited as an enforcer. She plays the lead guitar for her band. They play in the underground punk rock scene, which has a sizable following, mostly composed of youth. But if there's one musician she would like to listen to, it's Rina Takizaki. Her music has always affected her, and she harbors strong feelings for her. She doesn't care that Rina used to be a Sybil-approved artist now turned into a latent criminal. What's important is that she gets to listen to her and even play music with her. When Yayoi gets apprehended due to her psycho pass, she loses all contact with her friends and Rina. Her crime coefficient has gone up to 118 and her hue is medium blue. Now tagged as a latent criminal, she's brought to a facility where others are kept so they can be cured. In truth, the place is closer to an asylum. Every morning, a voice prompt will always remind them to work hard and strive to keep their hues clear and crime coefficient low. They also get to receive packages upon request, but it's not always as satisfying. Yayoi has tried ordering guitar strings, but her request keeps getting denied. She worries about her finger getting smooth due to not playing the guitar for a long time. She also worries about Rina and wants to see her again. If she throws a tantrum, her cell will light up red. A device will fill her chamber with gaseous relaxants, causing her to feel sleepy. Attendants will run to the front of her chamber, not to help her, but to observe how her hue changes colour as she falls asleep. If there's one thing that annoys her aside from the lame service delivery, it's the two inspectors who always visit her and invite her to be an enforcer. Inspectors Nobuchika Genosa and Shinya Kagami are persistent in recruiting her to the force, and she declines them every time. But one day, they come to her to get more information about the area of Kitazawa where she used to play. According to reports, an anti-social community is starting to form there. Many scanners have been destroyed by these people, and the CID needs to quell them before their actions get worse. Since Yayoi is familiar with the place, they expect her to cooperate with them. But she is stubborn and won't talk about what she knows. However, Inspector Kagami knows how to get her. He shows her the guitar strings she's always requested. He explains that the system has deemed her with the right aptitude to be an enforcer. That's why they're recruiting her. But if she works with them, there may be a way for her to get back to society, to see Rina again. And so she agrees to work with them on this case. She provides crucial information about the area of Kitazawa. She is not certain if the so-called antisocial community does exist. But if it does, then there are only two possible places for their base of operations, convenient enough not to draw the attention of authorities. It's either in Yellowhood or 27 Club. With this information, everyone sets to work to capture the culprits. Enforcers Masayoka and Sasayama are already dispatched to the said clubs. Inside the van, Gino, Kogami and Yayoi wait for the signal. Kogami explains to Yayoi that once a person is tagged as a latent criminal and admitted to the facility, there are no ways of getting out. Their only choice is to live there where everything is constantly taken away from them. But Yayoi has a choice. He hands her a dominator, saying it's been registered to her name. If she joins the force, she can be on the other side of the weapon. Gino protests, but Kagami stops him. It's only right to give her a weapon to protect herself. Just then, they receive a report from Sasayama, who's dispatched to 27 Club, about two suspicious individuals. With a hot head and careless manner, he shoots one of the individuals. 
Chaos fills the club as people panic to get out. Yayoi sees this chance to go backstage and look for Rina. When Kagami enters the club, it's already on fire due to Molotov cocktails thrown around. The second man that Sasayama reported is holding a woman hostage. He complains about the system taking his chance to fulfill his dream of becoming a musician. But Sasayama couldn't care less about broken dreams as long as he gets to shoot them. In a few moments, he distracts the man who lets go of his hostage. A mistake that has cost him his life. Meanwhile, Yayoi has finally found Rina. At first, she's relieved, but then Rina's companions arrive as well and they are all holding Molotov cocktails. It dawns on Yayoi that Rina is somehow involved with the reported antisocial community. But once they are alone, Rina reveals that she's actually the leader of that group. She invites Yayoi to join them, to topple the system and bring freedom to the artists that it has suppressed. But Yayoi won't come with her. All she wants is to sing and perform with her. Rina says that what she wants is pointless. They can't sing all their lives while being suppressed by the system. They need the power to go against it. Yayoi realizes she has that power, so she brings out the Dominator. She orders Rina to stand down. The latter looks insolently at her and starts walking by. Yayoi keeps warning her. She pulls the trigger. However, the weapon sees her as an invalid user and locks it. Yayoi is stunned as she looks at Rina walking away. Just then, Sasayama and Kagami arrive, bringing with them the hostage from earlier. Yayoi realizes Kagami has just tested her resolve by pretending to give her an authorized weapon. As she sits on the side, she contemplates her life. Things have changed. Kagami is right when he says there's no way for latent criminals to return to society. And he's also right when he said she has a choice to stand behind the dominator and apprehend criminals. She doesn't want to be on the other side. With that, she tells Kagami she accepts the offer of being an enforcer. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video.